Welcome back. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we're once again talking about San Martin. This time it's with the SN036-G, an interesting and attractive diver with a reported enamel dial. It's also one that showed me something I haven't seen for years, and not necessarily in a good way, but we'll get to that. This is also one from San Martin that expands upon their original or semi-original designs. At first glance of the dial and handset, you can tell that this was definitely inspired by Seamaster Diver, although there have been a few tweaks to it as well, whereas the case is something completely different. I've seen a few people online say that it reminds them of a Grand Seiko, but to me it looks more like an Aqua Terra. Either way, I thought it was an interesting combo, which is why I requested it from San Martin, and that is the reason for the promotional tag at the beginning, as this watch was donated to the channel by San Martin. Now, that said, let's quickly talk specs. For this one, San Martin went with a 41mm wide case, making it a sorta of in-between size when it comes to divers. Other than that though, it's fairly average for a modern dive watch. 48.5mm lug to lug, 200 meters of water resistance, a very solid weight of 168 grams on its bracelet, as well as a total thickness of 13.7mm, which does include the screw down case back, as well as a slightly domed sapphire crystal with AR. Now the other reason, and to me the more interesting reason why I requested to see this one, is that this is the first San Martin I've seen that has an option to come with a Miyota 8315 movement and that's a movement I've been dying to check out. The Miyota 8315 is a relatively new movement, and it's basically an improved version of the 8215, where the biggest difference being an expanded power reserve of 60 hours. Which may not sound like a lot, but to me it's a very exciting development for Miyota, as it's still a very affordable entry-level movement that gives you specs similar to the Seiko 6R series. And as it becomes more available, it offers the potential for a whole generation of affordable watches, both from micro brands and AliExpress that have an extended power reserve. Although all of this is assuming that it is a good movement, as there still aren't a lot of them out there in the wild, which is one of the reasons I've been dying to check one out. Now, unfortunately, the watch they sent me does not have the 8315, but it has just your standard 8215. Evidently, when I requested it, there wasn't an 8315 available. And before I could tell them that I was happy to wait for one, this one was already out the door headed my way. So here we are. It's still a very interesting, important aspect of the watch, but unfortunately it's not one I can give you first-hand experience with. Although, I can tell you about the 8215 that's in here. And honestly, it's actually been a while since I last saw one. When I started the channel, it was actually a pretty even split between Seiko and Miyota movements when it came to affordable watches. But these days, Seiko has become the dominant force. For the most part, the 8215 is a good entry-level workhorse movement. There are a few really good reasons that watch geeks prefer a Seiko NH35A over it, but for the most part, I'd say it's equivalent. However, in this specific instance, with this specific watch, two of those reasons have come back to bite it on the ass with a vengeance. So we might as well start talking about the negatives with this one, and the first one is the movement. Now first up, we have hacking, as in there isn't any. Traditionally, the 8000 series movements lack hacking, but a couple of years ago, Miyota announced that some of their 8000 series movements would be upgraded with hacking which definitely helps close the gap with Seiko. Specifically, the 821A was upgraded with hacking, and that's basically an 8215 with an upgraded rotor, as well as the 8315 should also have hacking. But as you can see here, this one doesn't, so it must just have a standard 8215. Next up, we have something I haven't talked about or let alone seen in years, and that is the infamous Miyota stutter, or as I like to call it, the safety dance. Now, if you didn't know anything about the shuffle, and you got a new watch and you saw it doing this, you would think there's something seriously wrong with it. But believe it or not, this movement is working as intended. This is a feature, not a bug, so to speak. As the 8000 series is designed with a safety feature known as an indirect drive or indirect seconds. The short version is that if the movement senses a sudden stop, or maybe extra pressure or tension on the second hand, it momentarily disengages the second hand to prevent damage. Now, while it's disengaged, the movement in the background is still accurately keeping track of time. 
and when it eventually re-engages the second hand, it actually speeds up just slightly so that it can catch up where the second hand needs to be. And it's important to note that a lot of other movements, a lot of other brands have this feature, but it's Miyota that's really become notorious for it. Most of the time, this isn't an issue. Like if the movement is laying flat, you're never gonna see this. It's just here the watch is on its side. And as the second hand starts to move downward, gravity is putting just enough extra pressure on it to engage that feature. In my own experiences, the sensitivity to this varies drastically between individual movements. So just like accuracy, it's really luck of the draw. With this one being a particularly bad hand, as this is one of the more extreme examples I've seen. So it's very possible you could buy one of these or any watch with an 8215 and never even notice this. But at the same time, you gotta understand that this is also a possibility. So just some things to think about, and you really should. Because if you were to get this or any watch with an 8215 and you don't like that safety dance, it's still technically functioning as intended. So brands aren't likely to do anything about it. And there's the question of if this really matters. Realistically, it doesn't impact its usability at all. It's more a matter of impacting your potential enjoyment of the watch. And if it does, there's nothing wrong with that. Just because it's a feature doesn't mean we need to like it. Because us watch geeks do tend to be overly OCD about this kind of stuff. And I personally don't like knowing this one is that sensitive. Now, we could go on about the movement thing forever, but let's move on to the other negative. And the other negative is actually the bracelet, which may surprise some of you, as San Martin is known for having some fantastic bracelets. And honestly, the bracelet here is quite good. Here you have solid links secured with screws, solid end links, and San Martin continues to have one of the best milled clasps I've seen. The problem is that it's ridiculously short. Put it this way, I have a seven and a quarter inch wrist, and for my wrist, I didn't even remove a single link. I just wound up moving the micro adjust down two for a good fit. For smaller wrists, this should be perfectly fine. But if you have over seven and a quarter inches or eight and a half centimeters, you're going to be out of luck with this one. So that was the bad. Let's now move on to the good. And despite that stutter, there's quite a bit here. First off, I like the design. I really like how this watch looks. I'd probably still call it a Seamaster homage though, but it's the kind of homage that most people like as it's not a one for one and San Martin has put their own twist on it. Here, the Aquaterra style case mixes well with the diver dial and domed crystal. It winds up creating a very sleek and streamlined looking diver. One that feels very modern, yet with a few vintage vibes. And I know that sounds a little contradictory, but it's kind of the same feeling I get when I look at a blue Black Bay 58. So maybe that'll make some sense there. The really long and wide polished beveled edges on the side are also a nice touch. They are a bit of a fingerprint magnet, but they really highlight the sleek outline of the case, as well as bring out those nice twisted lugs. The skeletonized hands are also going to be a bit polarizing, but I like them as long as the heads are wider like they are here. That way you have a larger tip with a contrasting color that should come through easily. And in general, this watch is really easy to read. Just like the case, the dial is rather clean and streamlined. The aggressive knurling on the bezel is perhaps the one thing that doesn't quite work here, at least with the streamlined case. But while it doesn't quite mesh with the design, it is quite functional, as it's pretty easy to get a good grip on it. It's also 120 click, unidirectional, minimal backplay, and has a great clicky action. The build quality is also top notch here, and that is the norm for San Martin. The SN036 has an extremely solid, well-made feel, and this is very obvious and apparent the second you pick it up. The quality is also apparent when you start to take a closer look at the dial. Supposedly, this is an enamel dial, and it does come through brilliantly with a blue sheen. And that allows the white highlights, as well as the mirror polish of the indices to really pop. The one exception is the very bottom tip of the lugs, as once you get the bracelet off, they're pretty sharp. It also wears really nice on the wrist. Despite the male end links, this one seems to perfectly hug my seven and a quarter inch wrist. The sleek case shape also caused the watch to wear just a little bit smaller than you'd expect. So it feels more like a 40 than say a 41. The loom is also really good. 
It has a nice blue BGW9 coloring that comes through bright and clear. It's also one that can go the distance. As in my longevity test, it was able to keep up with my Seiko Turtle. And lastly, another good thing is consistent branding, which is typically not something I'd list as a positive, but San Martin has had some issues with this in the past, where for whatever reason, they wind up putting a variety of different logos on the same watch. But here, you have the same hex logo on the dial, the crown, and the bracelet, as well as their Shark Diver logo on the case back. Now, some don't like the hex logo, but at least it's consistent here. As for what's just okay here, there are a couple of things. And the first is glare. And you can probably see that here in the shot. It's nothing horrible, but it is definitely noticeable. So perhaps some more AR coating would have helped. And lastly, we have price. These are currently going for 238 US for the 8215 and 278 for the 8315. Although the summer sale will be kicking off soon and they'll be dropping down to 218 and 254 respectively. So either way, that's about a $40 increase for the enhanced power reserve. And that's not too bad. As far as other Ollie watches go, San Martin prices are always on the high side. But I think San Martin is also on the higher side when it comes to their quality at least compared to most Pagani and steel dives. In fact, in terms of quality, I'd say this easily outpaces any similarly priced Seiko or Citizen out there. For this one, I think it's all going to come down to how do you feel about that movement, whether or not you're good with all its quirks and the possibility of the stutter. Honestly, if San Martin had just gone with a Seiko NH35, this review would be a lot easier and a lot shorter, but they didn't. And as such, it's a little bit more complicated to talk about. Now, in the past, I've reviewed plenty of watches with an 8215. And for the most part, I've had good experiences with all of them. And that does include a couple of old favorites. So I don't really want people watching this and thinking it's a bad movement. Generally, I actually like it. And I've had pretty good luck when it comes to accuracy with them. But just like with accuracy, there's a spectrum in terms of what you can get. So if you are actually interested in it, you have to think whether or not it's worth rolling the dice or just moving on to something else. Overall, I like what San Martin is doing here, but this is one specific watch you really need to know more about in order to make a good informed decision. It's really a good looking, well-built, comfortable diver. And that's just like anything else coming out of San Martin. And I do like that they're trying to incorporate the 8315 in some of their watches. And if you are interested in this particular one, that's the route I'd suggest. In fact, I think they should have just stuck with the 8315 and skipped the cheaper 8215 altogether. The 8315 may still be prone to stuttering. I'm not completely sure on that. But even if it is, at least there you'd have hacking as well as the extended power reserve as a reason to put up with it. Well, I think that about wraps this one up. But as usual, let me know what you think about this one down below, as well as what are your thoughts on the 8215 movement? Is it good? Is it bad? Or are you just indifferent to it? And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Shane. This is Relative Time. See you next time.